Hello, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG, and I'm just really thrilled to be here today for our AAPG Academy. And it's really a special treat. I feel like we're coming back to our roots. We're talking about conventional um, oil and gas and we're still admitting people, I like to remind people to mute yourself as soon as you enter the room. Um, we have a couple of really great guests, but before we turn to the guests, I want to make a few announcements. First of all, uh, please consider attending OTC, also our Your Tech and Conventionals resources in June, and also IMAGE, our joint event in, in August. Also, this is the time to start thinking about uh, joining or re renewing. You'll be getting your renewal packages. In, well, actually, it starts in July. But, but if you're not a member now, um, please join. Lots of benefits. <laughs> And also, I want to take a moment to, to point you to the chat. Go ahead and click that link and take a look at it. It gives you the opportunity to buy an extended package for $35, which will uh, yield you a bundle worth about a couple hundred dollars of articles and a bundle of, and some information about where to get free information and also a concept of, of ways to accelerate the the prospecting and um, getting uh, obtaining funding for funding and also bundling up the prospects for sale for conventionals. So today we're going to be talking to Tom Bowman and Steve Zodi, and welcome. And both are, are great friends and they, they have wonderful experience with conventionals as well as unconventionals. Okay, please mute uh, if you. And I'm I'm glad to say that they that we are going to have the opportunity to um, look at the use of unconventional technology and techniques to conventional and sort of superpowering the the endeavors. So um, both Steve and Tom have 40 years of experience in the industry lots of experience, they both operated, they're both still very active, and they have a lot to share with us. So we'll start with, with Steve, but if, um, and then we'll move to Tom. So Steve, if you'd like to share your screen, welcome. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Susan and AAPG for uh, uh, coming up with this great idea of, of this convention oil and gas exploration revisited. Um, when we first started talking about this a little bit last month, um, I think one of the, the questions we had was, you know, what's the target audience going to be? And um, in my mind, anyway, I was assuming probably, you know, mostly maybe younger folks that have 10 or 15 years of less of a uh, oil and gas industry experience and have primarily been involved in unconventionals. So if, if you've got a lot of conventional experience, um, at least my piece may be a, a, a little bit fundamental and, and review, but hopefully you, you'll uh, pull some tidbits out of here and, and take them on your way for some conventional oil and gas exploration. Um, let's start out, let's just talk, you know, what, what encompasses or what makes up a good oil and gas finder. And this is, uh, primarily taken from AAPG's Treatise of Petroleum Geology, which I would highly recommend if, it, if you haven't read this, or if it hasn't been, if it's not part of your library, I, I'd really recommend, uh, there's a lot of great information in here. Um, so I'm not going to read this whole page to you, but I've highlighted some things that, that I like and or thinks that are important, um, like being a risk taker or understanding the business side of the industry. Um, be prepared to be wrong once in a while. And I'm going to kind of hammer on this mantra of, of creative thinking and uh, problem solving. And I, th I think that's uh, fundamentally important for oil and gas exploration, especially uh, conventional oil and gas exploration. Now, just to as qualifiers to this, I like these two descriptions, which is controlled creative imagination and vivid imaginations controlled by the facts. What does that mean? It means you can have a great idea but you still have to be able to put some science behind it, put a story behind it, you know, make the maps, cross sections, what have you, and, and be able to support that idea uh, to get somebody interested in putting capital towards your idea and, and getting the prospect drilled. Um, 
as many of you, if, if you've been involved in the oil and gas industry for very long, you know that, uh, especially recently, uh, the, the media, the politicians, whoever, they don't uh, paint us, our industry, in a, a very favorable light. So you got to be a little bit uh, thick-skinned to work in this industry. And I think just having a deep satisfaction of, of uh, deep satisfaction of find, finding something of value for the betterment of mankind. Whoops. So again, problem solving, creative thinking. When you, when you think about our industry over the last 140, 150 years, it's pretty incredible to think, you know, starting in the late 1800s, moving out to remote locations. And of course, the last uh, decade plus of just uh, having this massive production uptick from the uh, unconventional resources. Um, so if you are a little bit younger, maybe you haven't been exposed to these two quotes, and I'd like to share them with you. I've, I've always referred back to them throughout my career, starting with Wallace Pratt in the 19, early 1950s. Unless men can believe that there is more oil to be discovered, they will not drill for oil. Where oil is first found in the final analysis is in the minds of men. And following that up with Park Dickey in the late 50s, we usually find oil in new places with old ideas. Sometimes also we find oil in an old place with a new idea, but seldom find much oil in an old place with an old idea. Several times in the past, we have thought we were running out of oil, whereas actually we were only running out of ideas. And I think we've replayed that scenario over the years where we said, oh gosh, all the, all, all the easy stuff's been found. We, we can't find enough. And, and, but this industry just continuously, it's amazing comes up with new ideas and new technologies and when we just keep uh, moving forward and, and fulfilling our obligation to society. Uh, successful ge geoscientists. I mean, I think this applies to all geoscientists, but I think even maybe more so for conventional oil and gas exploration. Again, here's that theme of creative problem solving and critical thinking. You know, be self-motivated and a team player. It doesn't matter if you're working for a large company or if you're an independent like me. I mean, you still need to work with uh, engineers, land folks, uh, partners, investors, what have you. Um, and you must be able to present your work again, whether you're with a large company or an independent. Um, you have to present to your management. You have to present to partners, investors or whoever it might be to, to be able to tell your story in a logical a supported fashion and, and get out there and raise that capital that is required to uh, get your pro project um, completed. And again, keep learning. The technology is constantly changing. Don't let yourself get staled. Um, stay up through AAPG, SPE, whoever. Um, take workshops, short courses, and keep, keep up to date with all that technology. And very importantly is network, 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 whether it's with AAPG, a uh, local geological society, or if you're trying to maybe cross-pollinate a little bit through SPE, uh, state or local oil and gas associations, get out, meet with people, talk with people, see what they're doing, see what they're interested in. You never know when those contacts down the road are going to come back and, and be of value to you. I, I pulled this out. I thought it was kind of an interesting little tidbit from an old workbook that I have, and basically pointing out that globally, the abundance of rock types um, that occur is 42% shale followed by the sands and the carbonates. But at that time, 60, almost 62% of the production was from carbonates, 37% from sandstone, and then this miscellaneous category of two and a half percent where you know, there's no mention of shales. You know, fast forward a few, decade, few decades, and this is from 2018 EIA data, so I'm sure these numbers have gone up even more than this. So 59% of the total US crude production and 69% of natural gas production was from these tight, unconventional uh, resources. So it's, it's kind of interesting now and, and fun that we're, we're actually pivoting back a little bit to uh, the conventional style of uh, exploration. Um, I put this out here just briefly. Let's talk about a little bit of global um, world production, consumption, and price. Um, just for reference, you know, I started out here in the in the in my career in the late '80s, where world consumption was roughly 65 million barrels per day, and we were entering this, I'll say, this awful period of about 15 years of not very good pricing. You know, bouncing back and forth between uh, 15, 25 dollars a barrel, somewhere in that range, but 
this consumption curve just kept climbing and climbing and climbing. And you know, along the way, there may be a little flattening, but in general, it's just climbing until we reach this over 100 million barrels a day of global consumption. Obviously, the pandemic pandemic called, caused a little blip in this curve, but um, all indications are that for 2022, we're going to be right back up here at or above pre-pandemic uh, global uh, consumption numbers. So global energy demand is continuing and will continue to rise, and hydrocarbons will provide the bulk of that energy supply for decades to come. So I think, um, you know, despite all the, the background stuff about energy transition, this, that, and the other, even, even if today is your first day in the oil and gas industry, I think you can ex expect a long and rewarding career in this industry. So just a reminder, many of you may have only worked with um, unconventionals, which are generally basin-centered, where the source and reservoir are one and the same. So don't forget um, the conventional fundamentals. You need a source and a migration mechanism and pathway to get to your reservoir with porosity and permeability. And that trap may be structural or stratigraphic, and it requires a seal to hold that hydrocarbon deposit in place in your reservoir. So say, so, okay, I'm going to go uh, start Trapes in the, the country for conventional type, type deposit. Where do I start? Well, there's, there's plenty of things to choose from. Depending on what your background might be or the base in your work, what, what are you familiar with? It may be uh, anywhere from simple to complex structural plays. Um, you know, maybe there's a, a structural field you're, you're familiar with. And there's stacked pays in there. Not all of these reservoirs have been developed and exploited. Or maybe there's a small offset fault block that hasn't been drilled yet. Um, maybe you're looking for uh, deltaic to channel type sands. Um, since you've been working in a basin and unconventional, maybe you come across some, uh, you know, basinal channels and debris flows, things like that. Or maybe you're going to hop back up on the on the shelf, get into a carbonate uh, shelf edge reef play, algal mounds, patch reefs, uh, the associated uh, slope deposits, or even moving back even further to tidal flat type environment. So there is uh, plenty of areas and opportunities to go look for conventional oil and gas reserves. Again, if, if uh, you haven't been that familiar or haven't worked conventionals, don't forget the rocks. You know, if you can get out and see an op outcrop, go on a field trip, it is just a, a wealth of wisdom and it really helps you visualize what you're trying to uh, develop in the subsurface. And, and even if you can't get on a field trip, there are plenty of uh, field trip guidebooks, outcrop studies, things like that. You can, you can take a look and kind of get these relationships in your mind and help you visualize what you're trying to map out and identify in the subsurface. You know, dust off some of those old uh, conventional cores, the, the sands and the shales, look at them, study those relationships, even, even get out some samples. There's, there's plenty of uh, sample repositories or companies that have samples. Uh, stored that you can get those out and, and, and really help you evaluate and, and visualize what you're trying to do in the subsurface. What do you have? What's on? Um, I, I add this in there just because I've worked the Permian a lot and been to a lot of these outcrops. But I mean, every basin kind of has its, its go to uh, place, I would say. But uh, especially in the Permian, if you get the opportunity that, I mean, the classroom is right next door, it really helps. And it's directly applicable to what's going on in the subsurface. Um, the well logs are probably going to be your best friend going back to a conventional oil and gas exploration. Um, you know, hopefully you've got more than maybe a 1950s era e-log. You've got a, some good sets of logs you can work with. And the primary difference may be now you're not looking at these uh, hotter gamma ray unconventionals, you're going moving back out into the cleaner gamma rays, the carbonates, the sands, etc. If hopefully you've got a good uh, neutron density curve that you can do some porosity evaluation, add in that a resistivity curve where you can start doing water saturations, hydrocarbon pore volumes. And if you've got seismic, uh, you know, hopefully you've got a sonic, you can get some velocity information and tie your wells into the seismic data. Um, again, Evaluate these. These are probably some of the areas you can get into and, and have some short term uh, quick impact looking at some of these bypass pay intervals. 
maybe there was drilled back in the 90s when prices were 15 to 20 dollars a barrel now that it's 80 to 100 dollars or whatever it may be the economics have, have completely reversed and it makes sense to get back and look at some of these zones or there's plenty of things that have been drilled through in these shale plays that the, that the operators just really had no interest in whatsoever, and they were just non-focused zones. Go back in and, and reevaluate those. Don't forget things like low resistivity pays, um, or all the zones in a field uh, where they all completed, where they all perforated, where the zones completed correctly, was the right acid job put on, was the right frag job put on. And maybe it was at the time, and now a modern completion uh, technique or uh, method can, can go in and, and give you an uplift in production in, in pretty short order. I'm not gonna get too in depth in, in petrophysics. That's a, a subject all of itself, but I'd just like to point out, I mean, there's been a lot of, a lot of good workflows and, uh, and uh, logging uh, tool improvements that, that, that have, targeted the uh, unconventionals. And so you're still going to go through a lot of these good workflow processes, which some that have been developed for the unconventionals, you can apply directly back to the conventionals. So the workflow process and the calculated parameters may vary slightly, but the end game remains the same. We're, we're trying to find and, and develop hydrocarbon resources. Okay, so now you, you've decided, I, I want to go look for this type of a play, you know, Understand your regional geology to determine if the trends and possibilities are, are fit your fit your prospect style. If you're looking at a sand type uh, reservoir, you know know the depositional environment. Know what the the uh, sediment source direction is coming from. Uh, likewise, if you're in a structural play, understand if you're in a compressional environment, an extensional environment. What what are the stress directions? Um, if you map out a fault does, or a uh, reservoir does that fit in with that uh, regional geology and make sense and and can I um, make a logical prospect out of that? And now once you've decided say to zoom in on a certain area and you kind of like it, um, my, my, I guess I'd say maps, maps and more maps. Just keep making maps, see what makes sense, see what helps you. See, maybe something will you know, turn up and say, man, I need to move on to a different area. And in general, I'd say, um, you know, the, the, a single map, say just a gross isopack or a simple structure map is probably not going to be enough to sell your deal. Now start looking at, at things like net pay and use your logs, start doing porosity mapping, uh, hydrocarbon poor volume mapping. There's, there's lots of petrophysical uh, parameters that you can put on a map and, and, and see if they help you out. And don't forget your production, you know, maybe EUR maps, and in some cases, even IP maps may help you out. Um, in some cases, it may be lithologic or facies dependent. You know, start mapping these things out, see what fits together, what makes sense, and start putting your story together. And if you're fortunate, hopefully you've got some 3D seismic and you can uh, add some seismic attribute maps in there to, to further bolster your prospect and your story. Don't forget, um, there's a lot of buried gems out there. I mean, everything's gone to digital databases these days, but not everything gets captured in these modern databases. I mean, it just depends who was digitizing or, or digging through the data at the time. Um, so there, I mean, there's a lot of missed information, uh, perforated zones, DSTs and DST results that are out in the well files or in, on the old well cards. I mean, this example is late 1800s wells from Ohio. Um, and these these well cards are are kind of locked in a in a file cabinet marked unlocated wells, so that the, you, you can't go to a map even today and, and and see where these maps are. However, you can kind of narrow it down. Um, so in this case, you know maybe you had the section, maybe you had the quarter section. Um, so it it pointed me in an area that said, okay, there's 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 hydrocarbons here. How can I expand on that with newer modern data? Um, magnetics, gravity, and, and then start uh, looking for an, an area that maybe you want to propose a seismic program. And not only that, it's just kind of fun to get a his, historical perspective from some of these things like this, when oil was, and gas were found in sufficient quantity to throw oil over the top of the derrick. I mean, that just gives you a cool little visual there. Or in this one, they produced it, but the well was ruined by shooting and uh, old Mr. Fisher knows more about these wells than anyone left in town. 
Man, wouldn't it be fun to sit down and have a cup of coffee or a beer with Mr. Fisher? So maybe you've, you've spotted this trend. So, okay, I've mapped out my regional geology. Um, I know there's this, this reef trend. There's some nice producing fields. I've got it mapped out pretty good. Um, now take the next step and kind of dig into individual fields so you have some analogies to work with. Um, in this case, um, there's, there's two wells here, again, 1950s era old E logs. And if you look at the logs, say, yeah, uh, they're only two and a half miles apart, two dry holes, and uh, maybe nothing's here, but we already know there's a reef field here, a 700 foot buildup, which is pretty impressive. But if you go back now, let's look at the samples. So in this one, we looked at the samples. It's uh, basinal mudstones with a very limited fossil assemblage, maybe just a few crinoids or something here and there. Move over and look at the samples, analyze them. In this well, well, lo and behold, we've got grain stones with a diverse fossil assemblage, maybe some oolites, uh, uh, forams, brachiopods, and that kind of thing. So now I can say, okay, yeah, I can identify. I'm on the shelf here. I'm in the basin here. And my shelf edge is in between here. So if I can go around and maybe find some more examples of this, now I've got an analogy and it may not be enough to drill a well, but maybe enough to uh, say propose a seismic program and, and narrow it down to that area that I wanna explore in. There's another example, again, knowing the, the depositional relationships, sequence stratigraphic relationships, and obviously uh, having some 3D seismic is, is always helpful. Um, in this case, again, it's a, it's a carbonate buildup and this is a, a stack series of these uh, uh, several cycles. And each cycle, the full cycle is, is a, a shoaling upward sequence. You start out with your lower mudstones and wacky stones and you grade and shallow upward into upper porous grain stones. And then these are all, each cycle has a little unconformity capping it. And so um, may, the entire sequence may or may not pre be preserved. So in this instance here, only the lower mudstones and wacky stones, the non-porous section of the cycle is preserved. But if we look at this log and this log, look at the samples, and now we've got a different log character. Oh, okay, we've got a little debris fan coming off this thing. So tie these two wells back into the seismic and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's exactly where I'd expect my debris fan to be. And so if I get up into this feature, I should get into an area where I have these upper porous grainstone shoals preserved therefore my porosity and hopefully some good production. Again, uh, it doesn't have to be true exploration. I mean, there's who knows how many hundreds or thousands of uh, old conventional fields out there. You know, you can dig back in to integrate all your data. And, and there's an example of field. It just has a couple of 2D seismic lines. So you're able to, to map out that reservoir in detail, um, go back, do your log calculations, analyze your porosity, your water saturations, your hydrocarbon pore volumes, and look at the production history. You know, maybe that'll tell you something about how that reservoir was developed. It wasn't developed um, efficiently. Um, go back and run your volumetrics. Um, say, okay, this reservoir should have held this much. Then look at your recovery factors. Does that make sense? Uh, should that re reservoir have recovered a lot more oil and or gas? If not, you know, start asking the questions. Is there more development potential? Is there another uh, location here that I can drill? Or is there recompletion potential? Have all the productive zones been perforated? Um, have they all been uh, completed uh, appropriately? And if so, if you're satisfied that, but you're still not satisfied that, that this thing has recovered everything it should, maybe, maybe there's a secondary recovery potential. Maybe you can go in and start a, a nice little water flood and get some some more hydrocarbon reserves out of the ground. I like this um, example just for uh, the uh, perseverance and improved technology pays off. Um, this is an example from the Southern uh, Michigan Trenton Black River play. Uh, this is a hydrothermal dolomite, which is controlled by deep seated faulting. Um, here, a lot of you may have heard of this field. It's the Albion Scipio field. Um, very long, narrow uh, body, uh, discovered in 1957. Really nice field, produced over 135 million barrels. So this is 1957. So you've got this big 
nice field out here. And so there's got to be another one, right? Well, everybody drills, 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 never finds any, no luck at all um, until 1983. Then Stony Point was discovered right here next door. Another nice, uh, you know, 14, 15 million barrel field, 1983, and same thing. Okay, now we're on our way. Um, there's got to be another one. So more drilling, more exploration, not a whole lot to, to speak for success-wise. So it wasn't until 2006, 2007, where a couple small 3D surveys were run to see if they could um, image and, and appropriately uh, identify this this type of reservoir. So there was one run here and they had some success, some success with a little southern extension here and, and a northern extension up here. And so at that point they felt comfortable. Yes, we can identify this type of reservoir. Moved over here, shot some more 3D and the, lo and behold in 2008, the Napoleon field comes in which is made over 11 million barrels. So now, yes, 3D can work in the, in the subsequent few years, uh, several other fields were discovered in this area. So um, again, perseverance and improved technology obviously helps and it pays off. So again, don't let past failures be a deterrent. Keep an open mind. I mean, here's an example. This is only four and a half square miles and there's 44 dry holes in here. Would you, would you take that deal? Would you drill that? And I'd say, yeah, it looks like goat pasture to me. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's three and a half million barrels sitting in amongst all those dry holes. Now, this is a little bit of an extreme example just because not all of those dry holes were, were drilled prior to a discovery, but still, it, it, it makes the point. You know, don't, if, if you've got a good story, if you've got evidence, you know, don't let those uh, negative data points always uh, influence your. Uh, your, your thoughts going forward. Now remember, you know, as geologists, a lot of times, you know, we're just looking at a, you know, primarily say an eight inch hole, and maybe you've got some samples from there. Maybe you've got a log, hopefully you've got a good suite of logs. And again, the, the creative problem solving, you know, use your imagination, put it together, see if it makes sense. And hopefully you come up with that hidden gem of a reservoir that's sitting amongst the dry holes. I uh, throw this in just because, you know, especially if you've only been working on conventionals, maybe you're um, just used to, to looking at things on this micron level porosity scale. Um, that's fine. You're still thinking in 3D, you're 3D visualizing. You know, you're just going to take this example, maybe scale it up to a few square miles, maybe square it up to hundreds of square miles. But um, it's, it's still very transferable from the unconventional to the, the uh, conventional process. Uh, here's just a quick example, something that we used in the Permian. Um, and really all we were doing um, was trying to do some detailed petrophysics and, and break a zone out into these, what we call petrophysical facies. Um, and that way we could just kind of, you know, lump different uh, categories together or split them out. Um, and really it was, it was trying to uh, determine the best landing zones, you know, what, what, what uh, characteristics offered the most productive uh, area of, of the zone and maybe what was what were barriers and things like that um, so you could lump them together and maybe only map toc or only map the porous carbonates or what have you but uh, things like this that that have been kind of developed for the unconventional world can easily be transferred um, to the uh, conventional world especially and if you want to go back and analyze a, a producing field and, and decide if, if there's more development potential in it Obviously, uh, data analytics and statistical evaluation has been a, a, a huge thing for, uh, during the unconventional development. And again, um, you know, this is out of a program called Spotfire. There's there's several of them out there now. You may not use the the exact uh, parameters uh, in conventionals versus unconventionals, but you can use this workflow and methodology and, and apply it um, to a conventional uh, exploration and development. So just uh, in summary, I'd say, you know, be creative, solve the problem, scour that data. There's, there's old logs, new logs, old well files and cards, new, new information out there, maps, maps, and more maps. And I, I emphasize this, you know, don't be satisfied with just dumping the data in your, in your mapping program and, and punching the button and, and taking what 
comes out as gospel. You know, make your own maps. You know, get in there and create your own contour lines. You know, make it, see if you can make sense of what, what you think your depositional environment is, your sequence stratigraphic framework. You know, know that regional geology, know your analog fields. You know, maybe you can improve past production and completion practices. And again, you know, stay positive and persevere. Sometimes you're going to run into a dead end. Um, you know, that's all right. Change course and uh, adapt to it. And there's plenty of things that have been developed for the unconventionals that you can adapt directly to uh, the conventional oil and gas exploration, petrophysical techniques and data analytics, like I mentioned. And again, look for that, those bypass pays. I think those are some good, quick, short-term things we can do uh, to increase some conventional production. And another thing that I haven't mentioned, I mean, there's been a vast amount of 3D seismic required over these unconventional plays. And probably a lot of the conventional stuff that's within that area has not been worked to any great extent on, on a lot of these surveys. So I think there's, there's just a huge opportunity to go back and, and work some of this 3D data and, and uh, really bring out some conventional type prospects. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you and leave you with my two favorite quotes and say, have fun and dream on. And with that, I think we'll uh, turn it over to Tom. Steve, <clears throat> Steve, very well done. That was uh, that was excellent. Uh, excellent, excellent work. I think you have to unshare. There, I'm, I'm finding that there it is. There we go. Great. Thank you. Well, I think Steve did a, that's an excellent job just, uh, you know, going through some of the, the techniques. I'm going to, you know, probably uh, repeat a couple of those things. And I think it's important that uh, when we look at uh, unconventionals and conventionals and everybody, you know, we've, through our careers, shifted from one, one type of uh, play to another. And in that process, we always think, well, we're not good at unconventionals. And then all of a sudden we're back to conventionals. We're not good at that. But I think there's enough um, overlap that the fundamentals of geology apply to both. And so I want to revisit a few of these things and talk about conventionals. Um, so I put together a little agenda. And, and my objective here is to and I, I convince everyone. I'm, I'm sure that's a little bit open. But uh, I want to convince you that the current unconventional knowledge uh, has improved our conventional knowledge. And our conventional prospects uh, are not that hard to find. And I want to give you a couple of examples of that. So I'm going to I'm going to just talk about unconventional plays, see what they provide us briefly. And then I'm going to show some examples of things we've learned and things we've applied from these unconventionals to a couple of prospect examples. And I think that uh, hopefully if I can get my objective across, then uh, we'll all come away with something better. I know I did by just putting this presentation together. Uh, so what do unconventional plays provide? And you know, we talk about unconventionals and, and there's so many people now looking at unconventionals, whether you, you've got five years experience or 25 years experience, or even like us, 40 years experience. You know, we, we, we've taken a step back with unconventionals and we've looked at, you know, regional geology in a little bit different application, basin analysis, uh, source rocks, all these things that come into the typical risk profile of a conventional, they became a standard play when it came to looking at, at, uh, at unconventionals. Petroleum systems, I mean, there was a time when um, any of our petroleum systems modeling people or even our geochemists had a hard time even uh, finding work. And now they're, they're forefront in the work that we do. But def detailed formation analysis is another thing that we've, we've taken a different look at here. And we've got all this new technology and new logs, new applications that we've developed for unconventionals that come right back and apply very well to the uh, unconventional system. And then as, as Steve mentioned, the 3D seismic and, and most of that data was used for, for hazard surveys. And uh, there's a lot of prospects left on that. And we might talk briefly about that. And then horizontal drilling, you know, lots, lots and lots and lots of horizontal wells have been drilled. And of course your, your hydraulic stimulation or as I put here, uh, uh, permeability enhancement, that's what we call it in states that don't like fracking. Uh, so the idea here is to 
apply those to some of the modern uh, uh, conventional targets. So it's, is it conventional? Is it conventional, unconventional? Um, you know, could be a little bit of both. So we'll talk about that. And I, I know Steve mentioned this and, and the last thing I have on here is teamwork. Uh, I can't harp enough on that is uh, nobody stands alone in this industry. Uh, you can't get by without the landmen. You can't get by without drilling completions. You can't get by all that has to be together. We have more um, uh, synergy now and more understanding. We have more completions guys asking subsurface questions. We have more drilling guys uh, asking questions. Uh, we, we learn from each other. We all get better. And I think it's important to, to keep re reiterating that teamwork uh, in this process. So let's, let's look at this. So this is a, a, this is a typical diagram you would see when we were focused on conventionals and then we had these unconventionals came up and basically what it is is anything that's got uh, <laughs> anything that's got low permeability so if it's low permeability if it's tight if it's uh, anything that fits out in, into this arena here which if you look at that that's the majority of the source rocks that we see or the majority of the, of the formations that we see are going to be unconventional and they're low GOR, they're uh, tight shales, tight oil shales, gas shales, viscous, heavy oil. And here's the conventional that we played for the last few decades. We stayed down in this area. And back when we put this together and we were talking unconventionals, we, we were always say unconventional is much better than conventional because conventional is fast gas. You, you, you know, it, 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 and you say unconventional has got a long life, long production life. It does, 30 years maybe, but at very low rates. But you, when you compare them, you know, you look at conventional, you, you look at conventional uh, uh, attributes, you know, the higher permeability, higher porosity is one of them. So you can say, hey, that's, that's a difference here. Um, you know, rapid returns on investment, that's a good thing. Conventional prospects bring you the return. They have a the fast gas, fast oil, you get it up front. You don't have to wait two years. These things are, you know, typical conventional prospects people look at pay out in less than a year. Uh, and they, and you know, maybe they have a five year, 10 year, 15 year life. They're not a 30 year, 40 year kind of thing like an unconventional. Uh, typically, they're going to be higher pressure. Uh, we can find a lot of prospects that are, that are low pressure. We can find a lot of pro, uh, that are normal pressure, but some of the bigger conventional targets are definitely high pressure, which is different for the drilling situation that we have. Most unconventionals uh, don't deal with high pressure. So there's going to be some differences there. Uh, cheaper, uh, you know, a conventional prospects cheaper than unconventional typically, because you don't have that, uh, that, that, that stimulation that's required. Or maybe you have a, a stimulation, but it's a lower stimulation. So you're not stimulating 10,000 feet, you're stimulating uh, maybe a hundred feet or maybe even 10 feet or 20 feet. So they typically, they're going to be cheaper. And of course, unconventional has brought us the this, this amazing drilling uptake. We're we're drilling twenty thousand feet uh, down and out in in seven days, which can be applied back to the conventional. So all of that fits in really well. Uh, may or may not be stimulation. You know that's something that uh, uh, we could talk about. I mean, a lot of these wells don't need stimulation. Uh, some of them do, but a lot of them have been fracked in the past. A lot of uh, stimulation is not new to the. Uh, industry. Typical shorter production life, maybe smaller area size. I mean, the, the benefit of unconventionals were, were once you found it and you proved it, it covered a large area. So now you're going to be rethinking this and going down to smaller targets and smaller targets actually uh, probably increase the risk. So when you think about pluses and minuses, all of them have their place in the industry, but fast returns in today's price environment, I think is very, very important. So we look at, at you know, the petroleum system. Let's just talk briefly about this. And I pulled these out of, um, this is the Barnett Shale, one of the first talks that uh, Dan Jarry put together on the petroleum system. Something that a lot of us had to go back and uh, rethink about when we got into the unconventionals was, you know, all of this, uh, all this shale down here and then all this Barnett's generating hydrocarbons. And then, you know, we look at, look at the petroleum system and we go, wow, you know, that's that's very, very interesting. And then and he puts together a diagram here. And this is when we got the, tech, the uh, terms uh, original oil in place, original gas in place. And, and we, we look at this and, and, and we realize that these unconventionals have expelled 70% of the oil and 30% of the gas. Well, where did it go? Well, it, 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 
it goes up. It, it goes up. And that's what I think people forget is, is it goes up to shallower targets, let's say. So you have this great source rock. Uh, when we used to look at conventional plays, we always had to find a source rock. And if we were in a mature basin, we knew that source rock existed. Or we would try to find just a position of the source rock to our, our formation. But now we understand a lot of this uh, hydrocarbons are expelled and they go up into shallower targets. And that's what I'm gonna uh, show you a few examples of as we come up to the near future. But you can look at the volumes and you go, wow, that's a lot. And then by the time we get down to what we're doing in unconventional, it's a, it's a small percentage of what was originally in place. And this was a the technique that, uh, that came out you know, when we started into these. This was of course Dan Jarvie in 2007, but uh, we've learned and learned and, and, and I think everybody in unconventional world understands this a little bit more now. So, so we go down here, talk about 3Ds. Now I pulled some examples in 3Ds. So I pulled the, you know, SEI's Gulf Coast, uh, GPI's Gulf Coast, big, big regional surveys, uh, CITEL, uh, Fairfield and Delaware Basin. Uh, and then I get American Geophysical here in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Fort Worth Basin. And you look at these surveys, most of these surveys, the new ones, they're done for basically uh, fault mitigation hazards, they're not done for conventional prospecting. I can tell you that some of this data in, in, the, in the Permian Basin, but this is the Delaware Basin, some of these surveys are shot over surveys that I shot when I was uh, shooting, acquiring surveys out in West Texas. And the, the quality of this data is, is hands down better than what we've ever had access to in the past. And we're using it for small faults and an unconventional place when there's a huge amount of information left for conventional targets. At one time we were playing the Gulf Coast, we had 15,000 square miles of 3D looking for conventional targets, bright spots, if you will. And then we got away from that. Nobody wanted to do that anymore. So we come back, now they acquire these big surveys and they're focused on one single horizon. And, and as we said, you know, we first got in the Barnett, I'm sorry, into the Eagleford, there was, uh, there was a, uh, uh, we had a conventional Austin Chalk prospect and they said, well, that's, uh, that has to go to our conventional team. We said, okay, well, let's talk to the conventional team. They said, well, we don't have a conventional team because we've all moved over to be uh, unconventional. And I think this is the situation where the 3D comes in where you have a huge amount of upside potential for these surveys. Now, getting the surveys obviously doesn't work for everybody, but a lot of people at these companies, they get so uh, focused on one formation and, and its attributes, they forget. Look up and down the section. So when, when, we, when I talk about horizontal wells, one of the interesting things is, so this is all the horizontal wells in the US. And uh, boy, we've drilled a lot of horizontal wells, lots and lots of horizontal wells. And if you just look at some of these, you can see, you know, we've drilled 36,000 horizontal wells in the Gulf Coast, mostly, most of that being, of course, the Eagle Fleet. But you look at each one of the basins, we drilled, 351,549 horizontal wells. All of those have gone through shallow targets above the source rock. Into the targets that most of those source rocks have expelled their hydrocarbons into. Most of these have been logged from the shallow, you know, usually shallow casing point or, or sometimes shallower. Now, they don't always have modern suites of logs, but they do have logs for correlation and for mapping. So you can make some detailed maps and basins which is the application of these. And now people are releasing logs a lot, uh, a lot sooner because it's an unconventional target. They don't see the, uh, the need to keep uh, logs proprietary like they used to in the past. When you had a, a, a conventional discovery, you didn't want anybody else to know about it. You tried to keep that log uh, tight for as long as possible. But if you look at any of these basins, we're talking 30, 40,000 wells per basin, penetrations, uh, points of, of, of reference, uh, the detail that comes from these logs alone uh, is phenomenal. And, and really, I'm going to talk a little bit just about the Eagleford because you've got 36,000 penetrations. Uh, most of them are logged. Most of those logs are available at the Railroad Commission. So you're not, you're not stretched a lot like you used to be in the past to get uh, to, to find logs. Now you're overwhelmed with logs. You've got a lot more data. So when, when Susan called about this, uh, I, I, uh, putting this together, I, I, I remember because you know, we've been playing conventionals and then we went unconventional. And I remember every time the cycle of 
passive hydrocarbons uh, changes, we, we get, um, get a whole new level of excitement for various prospects that we do or do, do not have. And I remember back in the day when we actually had printed maps, we were in, uh, walking down the street here in Houston, the price of oil was up uh, much like it is today. And uh, this, this person pulls over on his car and he rolls his window down and he, he yells at us, hey, hey, guys, uh, and you're, you know, in Houston, you're not willing to necessarily talk to anybody that rolls a window down. And he says, hey, you guys have prospects for sale? And, and I was you know, taken back a little bit. He goes, here's my business card. If you have prospects for sale, call me because we're, we're looking for prospects. Everybody's looking for them today too. Price of oil's up. They're looking for a diversity. And, and, and there's a whole market out there looking for conventional because they are less expensive and they can be done. So I kind of, uh, I took uh, this next slide for, uh, from a, a fellow geologist I worked with on a small team uh, many, many years ago. And they would always come to us and say, do you have another prospect to drill? So I, he coined this. We actually had this on the wall, prospects while you wait. And so I'm going to show you some examples, a few examples of prospects while you're waiting on the call. And just to kind of give you an idea, maybe get those juices flowing a little bit. So let, let's talk about orphan wells a little bit. So um, Texas has got 8,100 listed orphan wells. Um, some people would argue that's a, uh, that's, that's a bad thing. Um, you know, the easiest way to find an orphan well today is to, uh, to frack or stimulate a well uh, within a couple of miles of an of a open well bore. You'll find that uh, uh, well when it squirts oil on the surface. It's happened to me three times in the last six months. So you, you see all of these uh, orphan wells. So when you think about that, 8,102 just in Texas, um, are they concerns or maybe talk, targets of opportunity? So throughout a process here, uh, you know, most of these are logged. We pulled a log. This was actually a prospect we put together not that long ago. And this is an old shell log drilled in 1956. And this is the Escondido section here. And you go, well, well maybe it's some pay there, maybe some pay here. But again, we have a lot of modern logs now, modern techniques. And, and so now we have this thing called a, uh, a quad neutron. So that's the same log uh, with a quad neutron, and now you can actually uh, see the pay. So that's, that's taking an, an old orphan well that produced 15,000 barrels in a deeper zone, going back and cleaning it out, running a log, and, and it's not very true. Roke is the, is the logging company, and running this pulse neutron and getting a direct indication of the hydrocarbons. Uh, this prospect's been drilled and produced and productive. It did not take that much. We put together a 50 well package down here, uh, 50 orphan wells. The Railroad Commission was more than happy to have somebody take on the plugging liability to put this field together. And it's a process now of going through, you know, this, this log actually is up, is about right here under the Eagleford or above the Eagleford, I should say. But the Railroad Commission is more than happy to take, let shift that responsibility of plugging over to companies to come in, um, Reevaluate, remap, uh, relock in this case, and come up with with targets of opportunity. Uh, some of them are big wells that you know. Some they might be they might produce uh, 10, 15, 20 thousand barrels, but you have no drilling costs. And so you've taken something that would be a detriment possibly to the environment, and you've actually made something out of it with uh, with an application of, of of new technology. Mind you, this is a cased hole. Uh, so this is this neutron, pulse neutron goes through casing and it's a direct indication of hydrocarbons. It's fantastic. So then we go say, OK, so since we're talking about the Escondido, let's talk a little bit about the almost. So we look at the almost play. And, and of course, everybody recognizes, you know, Maverick County and, and Zavala and you know, Frio and LaSalle. And, you know, the whole Eagleford play overlaps this, this play. But you think about the Eagleford source rock now. We'll talk a little bit more about in detail, but this is really originally a very big almost play. Now that's, there's 54 or 5,600 productive almost wells out here. And you think now we've got 36,000 more penetrations through. Just think of the detail. And this is really, it's an interesting area because you've got source rocks off the Ouachita's from the north and you've got the, you've got the Laramide orogeny on this side. So you've got two different mountain building events dumping sediment into it and some people that have played this area recognize maybe big wells or uh big wells is uh right up here right there big wells 
ADP. That's how Swift got into the unconventionals is they actually had shallow production. Uh, this is a big area now. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But this people now are down here drilling horizontal wells into the almost play. So you've got this, again, sourced by Eagleford. Well, there's a few more shales between the, the, the Eagleford and the almost, but uh, uphold potential. So let's, let's look at this. So here's uh, one of the, uh, not necessarily the oldest well, but it definitely had an almost B sand. And you can see with that log, uh, you know, there's your almost sand. This is the almost section here. So you've got Eagleford below you, you've got uh, Escondido above you. And this is an example. And you can look at these fields and see, you know, they produced a tremendous amount of oil, 2 million barrels, 30 million, 1.6 million barrels. Uh, this is 110 BCF out of that gas cap from this part of the almost field. Something that is, a, is an Eagleford player people didn't even look at. And this is not that far from San Antonio, it's just outside of San Antonio. So you look at this and you say, hey, is there potential there? So, so yeah, there's potential. So I, I, I wanted to bring a log up and show you some potential and maybe a few people gasp on the line, but this is a 1957 discovery well. And of course you can see the quality of the logs that we work with and you say, well, that, that, that's a problem here. Um, you get a little more, you just map the marker, you map the pay, it's a couple of feet. Uh, one of these, uh, this one was an open hole completion. Um, this one was cased. So this was a barefoot completion, what they call it barefoot. They drill to the top of it and then drill out of it and produce it naturally. This one was, uh, was perforated. Uh, typically, some of these, most of these are not stimulated. Uh, they're definitely good candidates for things like uh, water floods. But most of us look at those logs and think, wow. And we, when you go back to these logs, what I do like about some of these old logs is there's all kinds of notes and information, little tidbits that Stephen uh, recognized uh, from scout cards. And that little piece of information, that little note that somebody wrote on there is probably something that's very important. But aside from this, that's a modern log. Now that's not a modern log, it's a modern processing of a horizontal Austin chalk well. So now this is an offset well. So you take this log digitized, you go through the process. Now this is a new tech log, so people are familiar with new tech, just another processing petrophysical log, if you would. Um, you've got three different pay zones in, in this well. And you can see now that this log, was probably a little bit better looking than this log before it was digitized and, and recalculated, but all the petrophysics will define that pay. So now you take a 1991 horizontal Austin chalk well and you look up hole. And this is what's up, up. and this is what Steve is you know, talking about. So you're always looking for other targets, bypass pay, pay above us. This is a good example. Now, this well was just recently offset uh, this year, in fact, just a couple months ago, 25 foot of pay. Uh, so now they're getting ready to drill their second well out there. So this is opportunity. Now, th this was not a re-entry. This well could have been re-entered, but everybody was concerned about, uh, you know, damage to the well. Uh, it, was, it was cheaper in this particular case to go ahead and drill a new well. And not always the case. So you, there wasn't the orphan wells out there. We would have probably done that. But uh, again, something that was already drilled through, has been sitting there since 1991. Nobody even looked at it. But you're in a productive basin. In a productive area. So since we're talking about an Austin chalk well, let's talk about the Austin chalk for a minute. Let's talk about that. It's up above the Eagleford. Some people feel that, uh, well, at least the Railroad Commission feels that the Austin chalk was sourced by the Eagleford. I I'm mixed feelings. I know there's a lot of hydrocarbons passed through it. I knew the Austin chalk can actually produce uh, itself. Austin chalk's a big trend. So what do we know about the Austin chalk? Just a few little things. It's, it's one of the major producing uh, fields in Texas and Louisiana, something that has had a life, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it extends really across, you know, from Mexico uh, all the way into Louisiana. And I think there's a, even the East Texas field has Austin chalk production. Uh, discovered in the 20s, uh, produced heavily in the 50s, and, you know, just goes on and on. And, you know, we, we really look back as really the start of the horizontal plays. Uh, when Oryx started playing it in 1989, and that's when this play took life. So let's look at the production history of this. So here's here's the production history play. And this is this is about, I made this yesterday. So you can see there's different lives in the Austin chalk play. It it, it starts off ah, back in you know the 30s and 40s, and it and it comes along as a typical conventional target. 
And then it has an uptake and then a real big uptake here and then it falls off. So let's look at this. So I know we're not supposed to talk about the, the Russians necessarily, but the USSR drilled the first horizontal well in, in, you know, in the very early 50s, which, you know, that technology took a long time to buy off on. And if you ever drilled a well in Russia, you'd understand why. But really Oryx and, and then Mobile and Amico and Union Pacific particularly got in, involved in the in 85 and 6. Well, they got involved in, and typically when they get involved in, and you start looking at horizontal plays, you start to really see these things. And this was the conventional play. This is the, the play that a lot of people got into, like Clayton Williams, where they were chasing the fractures. And they had a couple of really smart geologists who figured out how to predict fractures. And that took off. And then the play died, right? So then it dies and it starts to pick up again. So people say, well, I'm looking for fractures. Let's drill horizontally. And so you started looking at the first horizontal well, and that was 89. Well, then as soon as one person does a horizontal well, everybody does a horizontal well. So then it you know, does its thing, industry sh shifts to a different direction, uh, away we go. And then, you know, during the, and I'm gonna put this on 1991, they drilled 5,700 horizontal wells in the Austin shop, phenomenal amount of, of production. But the latest uptick, is right here. Now that's 2016, 2017. I call it Gen 3. So what, what caused the revitalization of, of this play? Well, first off, you have Eagleford below it and you've drilled 36,000 wells through it, uh, most of which had shows. And you say, well, what can we do now that we didn't do then? Well, you start to look at this a little differently. You look at it like you would an unconventional. Is it conventional? Uh, I don't know, is it unconventional? Uh, is it both? The application of the unconventional technology is what's bought you something here. So you take, you look at what's going on in the Austin Chalk. And now, mind you, we're drilling a ton of Eagleford wells out here. But this is since uh, 2017. There's 787 new producing Austin Chalk wells, 388 active permits. And if people have been looking at uh, EOG's most recent uh, work, they, they have a little play going on down here in Webb County underneath that almost play. Uh, so you get uh, this little area right here has got uh, almost, it's got uh, now uh, Eagleford and of course now Uphole of uh, uh, Austin Chalk. And they're big. Uh, these wells are 25, um, 25, 30 BCF. I mean, some of the first wells EOGs drilled down are using uh, uh, horizontal, unconventional technology have been producing, uh, you know, five BCF uh, a year. Uh, actually, some of them are actually better than some of the Eagleford wells. Again, you put a lot of uh, holes through it, get a lot of logs, you can make some pretty detailed maps. But this trend is going on. Of course, everybody knows the Carnes Trough and of course the East Texas stuff over in here. People are continually looking at revisiting these old fields. One of the things that horizontal uh, unconventional technology has, uh, has taught us too has been uh, drill these wells parallel to each other. You know, we don't just randomly drill wells. Now we start thinking about stresses and we think about direction. And we try to maximize that and try to drill. I know West Texas, the, the Delaware Basin, people were drilling in that, what we thought was a regional stress, northeast, southwest kind of orientation, uh, or northwest, southeast, sorry. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes in and drills east, west. They, they, again, a new idea with something old. So the Austin Chalk, another target. So we talk about this. The Austin Chalk is made one and a half billion barrels of oil and seven and a half TCF of gas. I mean, and this, this, there's probably no end to, to extending this opportunity. Uh, you know, it has had good times, it's had bad times, but it, it continues to give hydrocarbons up and it's technology driven, it's understanding those reservoirs. And of course, drilling a bunch more pinpricks through it really helps that. So does this work everywhere? I guess the question comes is, uh, does this work in other basins? Uh, well, I guess I, I put together an Austin chalk well. So I, I put this together because here's, here's the, the 70s to the 90s. We were drilling vertical wells, chasing fract fractures. Then we start drilling horizontal wells, looking for fractures. And now we start drilling horizontal wells and we start fracking uh, these wells. And that's the direction. So what it is, it's a unconventional technology improving traditionally conventional reservoir. So you're, you're using that knowledge and pushing it forward. And I think when you, you step back and say, the Austin Chalk's a great example. Are there others? Uh, 
can you can you apply this? Can you look up hole in other basins? Um, and so I put one last uh, set in here. So let's look above. So I've jumped here. Let's jump to the Fort Worth Basin. Can we apply the same thing I just showed you in the Eagle Fruit in the Fort Worth Basin? Can we go above the Barnett? And there's a really interesting uh, thesis put out by, by a very smart young lady, uh, Victoria Wood, and she's published a one AAPG article. And she talks about uh, depositional systems of the token Grant Sands in the Barnett Basin, above the Barnett. So she's in the Fort Worth Basin. So everybody knows the Fort Worth Basin is strategic. Stratigraphically, you're looking at that section. And here, right down here, of course, there's your Barnett Shale. Grant Sands are right above it. Now there's shallow production in Boonesville and other things above it, but, uh, and then of course there's the Ben Lime that's been productive, but nobody's really focused on these Grant Sands. She had an opportunity to do some work uh, with, with Devin and she put this together. So here's, here's a typical look. Now here's the uh, Marble Falls and the Barnett's right below that. And so now you have this section of these Grant Sands. It's pretty interesting. So she, convinces, at one point, convinces Devin to go ahead and drill it. And here's a, just a stratigraphic cross-section across here. And you can see, you know, that's 23 logs, great correlations. She pushed the forward, uh, the idea forward. Now, Devin did some tests and did pretty well. They didn't continue because they ultimately sold the asset. But there's her map. I know we talked about maps, maps, maps. You talked a lot about maps. This is a net, net pay map. And interesting enough, you can see there's some some pretty high areas in that pay. The thing is that she's cut her map off, you know, conveniently, probably to cover their acreage. Um, I can tell you that there's more opportunity than just in this, in this map. And that's one thing about a map is if you show a map, everybody runs out and tries to get a lease within that same map without thinking regionally, if that's the area of the Grant Sands, are there other areas or is this a bigger play? I can tell you it's a bigger play. So I'm going to show you an example here. So this is, this is a well I drilled in the Barnett, drilling for the Barnett. We drilled uh, this little well in Parker County. Now this well is considerably, you look at this map, this, this well is way off this map down the Southeast. And so what we did, we put, as a rule, we always ran shallow logs and we ran a complete log sweep in our shallow section. Not, not all operators do that. But we did that, we ran full petrophysics on it. And of course that gets folded up, put in a well file and never looked at again. But here's a, a section of the Grand Sands right there. And you can see the pay flags and you don't have to zoom in and look at the log. This is just a, uh, a typical petrophysical log that's, that's conventional logs and then the petrophysics and then the pay flags sitting down the side here in the column. And that's just one section of, of the Grand Sands. Great opportunity. So up hole, you've got a great source rock below you. You've got great traps in the Grand Sand uh, uh, this is one area, and I know if you, and, and I'll just, and I didn't put the cross section in here, but if you got out to the middle of the basin, you could find that there's five uh, zones of stack pay out here. So, I mean, you're talking depths 3,000 to 4,500 feet, as many as five individual targets stack pay behind pipe, um, tested horizontally by Devin and, and, a, and a couple of the other operators. So people looked at this briefly. It, if it doesn't, and sometimes it takes a while for a prospect to come to maturity, uh, but it does have both horizontal and, and uh, vertical uh, potential. If you looked at it from the horizontal stimulated wells that, uh, that Devin tested, you are probably one to five BCF potential. But if you can drill these at uh, 4,500 feet uh, in and out for less than 2 million bucks, uh, that's going to be pretty, pretty economic. Uh, most wells are hydraulic and stimulated. You don't have to. Chasing sands with a horizontal well is going to be a little more difficult, uh, but there's plenty of people who can do that. But if you can stack three horizontals or four horizontals, this place starts to look very much like the Wolf Camp play in West Texas, where you have all kinds of stacked pay. So kind of brings me around to what have they provided? Just give you some conclusions. And, 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 and I talk a little here about, you know, look up both metaphorically and literally look up, always look up. Now this with positive attitude, things come into it, but you know, you look up, there's always bypass pay. Uh, you've got so many wells have been drilled and logged. You have tons of targets to, to play attention to. So the, you know, you have a lot of opportunity out there and I've shown you two, two basins. I could show you five more. All of them have uphold potential in them. And this is one thing I put in here is back to that teamwork thing is how many times you've heard the drillers and the mudlogger say, 
hey, you know, we always have a show in that shallow section. We drill through, we have a big show. So, you know, those, you know, that teamwork, sometimes you're gonna find the, 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 the simplest piece of information that's going to drive you down the path. And sometimes you'll go down rabbit trails but uh, you're going to drive you to be looking at things because these guys, man, they, they may not even put that in a report, um, but it's something they always look at. Source rocks have lost a tremendous amount of hydrocarbons and most of it's gone up and it's been trapped in conventional formations. That's what buys us. So I put one quote in here and, and Stoplin is, a, uh, I guess he's the CEO of Yelp and, and you have to be very nimble, very open-minded. And, and this is the, the second half of this quote was, your success may be de very dependent on how you adapt. And I think that's important for this industry is we've seen this change in, in from one thing to we've seen prices go up in 40 years. I've seen the price go up and I've seen it go down, go back up and go back down. I've seen the negativity of the industry. It's in the positive parts of the industry. We're doing things here, but we have to be nimble. We have to be open-minded. Um, and we have to adapt. And I think that's what we did when we moved into unconventionals. And I think that now is going to make us better conventional uh, uh, explorations, if you will. So that's that's all I have right there. But, uh, you know, thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. So Susan, it's back to you. Great. Oh, this is really great. I, I'm so excited about a lot of the things that you are saying. And we have um, we have so many different ways that we can we can attack this but i just love the the fact that the the main thing is to to like look where there's unconventional uh production and just recognize what's going on in the the migration pathways and how and the tools we have to see things in a different way so let's take a look at um let's take a look at the questions Whoops, some chats kind of. Um, okay, so Lisa Gusek is mentioning, don't forget the oil libraries. Tons of donated, frequently older materials that you won't find any, anywhere else. Strip logs, mud, mud logs, old scout tickets. Lisa, that's totally correct. If you want to open up your microphone and, and comment a bit, and if anybody is familiar with uh, Mid-Continent, Geological Library. I used to be a member of that years ago when it was Oklahoma City Geological Library, but they've digitized. And so um, there, uh, there's the, the physical paper, but then there's also the, um, the, the amount that you, the, the, all the digital resources. So Linda Sternbach says, Tom, do you think geologists today want to do the hard work of getting back to samples and logs? Or do people just want to get easy to get data to save time? Question mark. Well, there's 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 two sides of that. And uh, great question, uh, Linda. So inherently we're we're as, as humans, we're we're somewhat lazy. But uh, and so when you're you're actually generating a prospect, you're going to have to do that work. It's required. You're going to have to put the time in and the work in. But when you're selling that prospect, you're going to have to provide it uh, to wh whoever's buying it in in a complete package where they don't have to do the work. So you know it's a different side of the, of the coin. If I'm if I'm on if I'm generating and going forward, yes. If I'm buying, no. You want to provide it for you. And some of the most successful prospect generators that have been out there. Uh, I know Yuma was one I can, I can talk. They, they would put together a, a prospect book that had everything in it. And it makes it very easy for an investor to look at it. All the work's been done, but somebody has to do the work. I think it's, uh, yeah. And actually I, I, you know, I have a microscope. I don't have to sit on the desk, but I, you know, I, I don't mind digging in the samples. I think it's important. And I know Linda does the same thing. So does Charles, but uh, I don't know, Steve, you might have a comment on that. No, I think that's I think that's right. You, you, you have to do, especially in conventionals, especially if you're looking at an exploration type project. Um, yeah, you just have to do the work. And, and I, I don't know that I think her question was, are, are younger folks willing to do that? And I think like any group of people or any any profession, there, there's a lot out there that probably are more than willing and probably some that maybe try to 
would rather not and, and go about it a different pathway. So, but I, th I think there, it's, there's definitely folks out there that are willing to do the work. So Lisa Gusek says that her microphone wasn't working, but um, Denver Earth Resource Library is a great one here in Denver. The Oil Information Library in Fort Worth is another one. I know that one. And you can find a link to others through their websites. So yeah, that's really good. Um, so William Benson um, mentions, and William, if you want to open up your microphone and, and, and comment, feel free. But he says, there's no time savings. There's only hard work trolling through large volumes of old data. Online well bases, there are 10 to 20% incorrect at minimum. Oh yeah, that's, that's one thing I'd like to maybe um, have Steve and, and Tom address. So there's a information, there's, there are errors, there's lack of data, and then there uh, were deliberate shenanigans with um, well logging and et cetera. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I guess, okay, Tom. Oh, Steve, I'm, I mean, yeah, we 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 do deal, deal with that every day, and and there are places where people have purposely put incorrect information on map because they use that as their copyright. So they know if that map gets out, there's going to be that error is going to be there. Um, you know, if something doesn't fit when you make maps, you always go back to to the you know to first things you look at KB. Uh, and then shortly after that, you look at location. The benefit we have today is we have Google Earth. And at least in West Texas and South Texas, you can see well scars on Google Earth uh, 50 or even 100 years later, they're still there. Um, so you can usually correct most of that. It is time consuming. And that's what I think as scientists and, and the younger people particularly is your databases become very valuable because you've actually put in that work and made sure those things are correct. That you'll see things that don't fit on purpose sometimes, sometimes because it didn't fit leads you down a road towards a prospect. Uh, but it's very important that, uh, and it's time consuming and it's frustrating. And you're right, you spend a tremendous amount of time today as a data scientist and not as an explorationist. And it's just part of, the, it's part of the job. But the younger guys that are on this call, I mean, these guys are whizzes at, uh, at uh, GIS and and uh, and and being for them, you know, making these corrections is uh, pretty easy for us. You know, we it's one more technique we had to learn. We had to go digital at one point in our careers. I always think you know somebody's deliberately, and we, we know which operators often did that. You think, okay, <laughs> it's it's actually a way to, to target opportunities. But anyway, Steve, what were you? Um, no, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, you, you've, you've got your uh, class clowns out there, no doubt about it. And then, like you said, usually they've got a reputation and you can kind of the red flag goes up as, as soon as you see a certain operator's name. But, you know, some like I said, you just you just got to constantly call and and review your, your data. I mean, sometimes it's, it's just something simple. Somebody, you know, just put a instead of 2,100 feet for the elevation, they put 2,200 feet and that's things like that pop up. You still got to go back in and correct it in your database and, and just constantly be on the watch out for those types of things. So here's HV says, you made a good comment about pulse neutron locks. Today's modern pulse neutron locks are much more sophisticated and include capabilities to deliver min mineral analyses. In other words, to define rock matrices and insight to case toll porosity determinations. Oh, that's a nice point. It, it's a great point. And you know, this quad neutron tool is not expensive to run. And in fact, Roke is a small operator. They will run that for, for really next to nothing in comparison to, but yeah, the, the, the tool quality, and again, that's the, the, the tools that have been designed and driven towards uh, unconventional and, and more detailed analysis, and they are great applications to conventional targets. Great, great comment. Okay, so Henri Dyer um, points out, Tom, you mentioned that conventional provides quick returns and unconventional re returns are longer. I thought it's the opposite, and this is why private equity jumped in. Hmm. 
It's because uh, of the margin flow of that well, private, uh, private equity jumped into the unconventionals because yeah. the risk profile changed. It was no longer um, as risky. And, and, you know, and we sold, mind you, we sold unconventionals based on that. Yes, we did. But it was the fact that I can drill a lot of wells and my statistics are going to be in my favor. I'm going to drill. It's back to the to the to the profile. I, I, I got you know a P10 to a P90. I'm playing. I'm a P50 player. I want to be a C player. And I, if I'm a consistent C player, then my risk profile changes, and that's what makes it exciting for investors. Uh, Wildcat, you, you're going to go back on conventional Wildcats if you start. In, I know there's a comment about Wildcats. You're going to have to go back and revisit risk and how you associate risk. It's going to be different than unconventional. Once an unconventional has been determined economic, it's a matter of statistics and a matter of cutting costs. When you go into conventionals, you you, you know you could easily go back into the one in ten, so you have a ten percent chance of success with application of technology uh, like logs or seismic, and you might get to the eighty percent. Uh, so you drill eight out of 10, but you're still going to drill dry holes. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing for people to think about coming from unconventionals back to conventionals. We all think our prospects are, are 100%, but we all know they're not. Well, the orphan, the point of that orphan, that's a way to, to de-risk. I mean, you don't have the upside potential, but you, you can de-risk a bit. Well, you because you you've reduced your cost, right? So now if I if I can go get a well for free, run a log, determine there's pay, and I'm basically back to pretty close to 100 percent, and my economics are much much better there because I I don't have all the upfront costs. I have to take a lease, I have to get the road commission to give me the well. The risk I take there is re-entering the well, and and you never know what clown dumped a you know a upside down drill bit in it or you know put a whatever else I might've poured down the well board. But uh, you, you, once you get over that and you can get back in these wells, your risk and your, so your whole prospect entry fee is so much cheaper. And if you're getting uh, 10 to 50,000 barrels out of it, it's very, very economic that way. Yeah, the only like caveat I would say, you, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, the orphan wells often, I mean, every single owner in the, in the um, chain ownership change is, chain has either disappeared or gone or is bankrupt. So you then by taking over are going to be the only solvent um, <laughs> entity in the ownership chain. So we kind of really have to do a big assessment of what how much they've messed up the environment before well, leaving leaving well bores open to the environment is not a good thing. Um, yeah. it, you know it's just you know there's methane leaking out of them. There's a lot of issues. Uh, and, and anything you can do to prevent that. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people out there, including the Road Commission, are looking at these and wondering what, what that damage is to the environment. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. Uh, not all your orphans are going to be successful candidates, but uh, I think there's a lot of them out there that are. Yeah. And, there's, and mind you, I said 8,100 uh, wells that are listed as orphans in in Texas, but there's probably double that uh, that are under some stage of um, of uh, the, you, they file paperwork to keep these wells basically inactive wells in a active even though non productive situation. So that you basically people filing uh, reports on probably another uh, ten or twenty, maybe thirty thousand wells that are not orphans, but they're just sitting there. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, you're right. The orphans have a particular membership, but uh, but uh, there's a bunch more that are sitting there that are just well bores of opportunity. Saves the drilling cost. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Okay, um, but I know that in the Ap in Appalachian region, there's so many orphans that like drones are kept busy just trying to figure out where they are. Yeah, they've, I know like Ohio has really ramped up their idle and orphan well program. They've got, I mean, it's become a business for you know, some of these service companies to go in and, and just start bidding on, you know, plugging packages. And, and it's, it's been successful. I think they've done a really nice job of uh, uh, cleaning up a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, if you can actually get them to produce, it's all the better if there's infrastructure around and all that. Um, Salim Shaker says, great two presentations. Unfortunately, offshore potential is not included. There's a wealth of data in the BOEM office. Some of the marginal producing fields were abandoned 
due to pricing and merging. Any comments? Um, I, I, I guess time was limited and my offshore experience is even more limited. So that's why it wasn't included in, in, in my presentation. So. I, mean, I agree there probably is, you know, a lot of opportunity. I think there is. And I just think that, uh, and, and I, I didn't include either in, in uh, not for oversight. It's just, I felt like, uh, you know, thinking of the audience here, uh, very few of us can, as independents or, or even small companies can play offshore. Uh, but there was, a, there's a couple of companies that have been out there that were buying old, um, old, old uh, platforms and doing a bunch of recompletions and the same opportunities uh, to go into recompletions exist offshore as they do onshore, mainly because, again, you get focused on your target horizon and, and you know there's uphold potential in these uh, offshore wells, but, you know, those people have retired and gone on and nobody continues that uh, succession. So you go back and revisit offshore fields all the time and find up whole potential. I've done several of those in, in for other companies and they, they come in and say, is there anything left here? And you, you go back and remap it with uh, 3D and yes, uh, uphold potential exists uh, just as much offshore. It just is a different type of player than what we, we thought was gonna be here. But yes, I think it's the same, same always look, look up. Uh, and of course, you know, good 3D offshore is, is, is the winner. The small fault box that, that, that uh, Steve mentioned uh, that hadn't been drilled, didn't drain, um, volumetrics that don't match. You have much more, you think should be much more hydrocarbons there than what you actually produced. That's an opportunity. It's a big opportunity. It works the same way offshore. Um, Thank you for uh, for great answer. I have a little question here. I, I'm a little bit confused about defining the orphan world and uh, unconventional because I read about it and I, I'm not a con unconventional guy, I'm an offshore guy. So can somebody just give me in a simple, simple format or simple sentence, what's uh, orphan well? How we define an orphan well? Uh, basically an orphan well is, is, you know, at least on an onshore perspective, you know, it's a well that, has never been properly plugged or, or plugged at all. And uh -huh. um, may maybe that owner was back and drilled in the 50s, 60s, or even prior to that. And, and they've all long gone away and there, there's no company left or no contact left. And, uh, you know, the state tries to uh, track them down because that well needs plug because it's been sitting there idle. And, yeah. uh, there, there's just no operator of record or, or no one... Uh, so there's no supervision. Yeah, so they're just basically been. This left. is orphan well, huh? Interesting. <laughs> all right. No, we didn't have an offshore orphan wells at all. All was the MMS or BOEM, whatever is just supervising everything. And you have to plug this, you have to shut down this. Well, it's pretty interesting. Thank you for wonderful presentation, two presentations. Yeah, thank you. Um, so John Cassiano has a question. Tom, with all the uphold potential out there, how do you feel about wildcat opportunities away from more established producing fields? Well, I mean, everybody loves a good wildcat. Uh, and, you know, we've had some pretty phenomenal wildcat uh, uh, geologists in our past and our history that we, we all know, and, you know, Michael Halbudis and uh, and Ralph Lowe's and all those guys that drilled wells, even to, to, to a large degree, Clayton Williams and others. But, you know, there's going to be, a, there's always going to be a market uh, for that. When I first got into unconventionals, you know, I drilled a well uh, in Valverde County and it was uh, was much higher CO2 than what we anticipated. But we had uphold potential. And the company I worked for, I was uh, exploration manager for the company. And, they, and, and they, I said, let's just go ahead and, since we're coming out of the hole, let's go ahead and perforate this shallow sand. And they, 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 uh, they said, well, Mr. Roman, you have to understand here uh, how much hydrocarbons you're going to get. And I said, well, you know, BCF, maybe two BCF. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're in the business to drill one well to get 100 BCF, not 100 wells to get 100 BCF. Now, mind you, we've changed. So now we're unconventional. That's very much what this was. This, is, this actually became Pakenham Canyon Field. 
And uh, we had sold, we sold the prospect to, to a gentleman who uh, uh, about three years later sold it for um, $83 million and, and became Wildcatter of the Year. But he took a well that, that we, we gave him basically. And, uh, and, and he turned that into to a very productive plate because he was willing to drill the 100 wells or 200, you know, 50 wells or 100 wells to get the 100 BCF. Wildcatting comes back around because you get chances and opportunities to drill very large wells. And there's always going to be a market for that. There's going to be people who are willing to take that risk. But your risk is high on, 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 on targets like that. And it's deeper. They're more expensive. They're much harder projects to put together. And I've drilled some, some doozies. I mean, first, one of the first ones I drilled was outside of San Antonio. I drilled a 23,000-foot Ellenberger test underneath the Wachita's. Uh, right on I-90 out of, out of San Antonio, up, which would be considered to be up to part of the Eagleford. Um, and it produced gas, but not at the quantities we needed at the time uh, to produce. But that structure is uh, 10 miles wide and 30 miles long. It's a huge, huge structure, but it has to fit everything at the right time. And it took, uh, took a long time to drill. It took a lot of companies to put that prospect together. But uh, those opportunities, people are willing to swing for the fence. Um, a lot of us are pretty much into the you know base hit kind of deal. Uh, you'll see uh, conventionals deep. I say deep; they don't have to be that deep, but you'll you'll see them come back around. So a tremendous amount of opportunity in the Wachita thrust section. Um, there's a lot of conventional uh, deep targets in the Permian that people are going to start looking back at now that they have all this great seismic data. You'll you'll find people willing to drill the the deeper wildcats. And I think that's gonna come back around. And that's really a very exciting part of, of the industry that I, I very much enjoy. Steve, I'm, you might comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's there's lots of things that are, are slowly coming back. Um, you know, there may not be as many people out there, you know, rushing to go to the higher risk prospects, but but they're out there. I mean, you just have to have a, a good story and uh, find the right people, um, you know, and like you said, there has been, I mean, going back to the previous question, you know, like when I started working the, the Permian about 10 years ago, and, you know, the, you, whether you're a public or reporting to, a, you know, a private equity or whatever, they wanted to see that, uh, what's your inventory? And that was really all they cared about. And then eventually that transformed in, oh, well, you need to be a little bit more uh, careful with your capital and, and start worrying about returns now. And, and it, so it, it, it's kind of evolved. And um, the, sa the same thing, you know, some of this uh, exploration mentality has kind of been shelved or, or retired or whatever. So, I mean, it, it'll take a little bit of a process for uh, you know, people to come back, but I think it's out there. So, so um, we've got time for a few more. Um, oh, we've got one more question. I want to, um, to, um, point out what John Drivis said, uh, there's certainly a lot of offshore opportunity on the shelf of, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico for this backyard play. And don't only look up, but also out. The hydrocarbons are going where the pressure is lower and that can be down as well as, as up. A lot of Norflet potential left out there below the smack of Oh, super interesting. And then there's a uh, Paul Devine, says, how about a comment regarding regional screening of triple combo logs using algorithmic processes to high grade areas for detailed prospecting? So a screening tool using well, machine learning. Or I something. mean, you know, we're seeing some of that. And, you know, we first we first got in a lot of these plays, uh, Eagleford for one, Barnett another, but we would always run all, maybe run the same logging company or different logging companies, same well. So we would run everybody against each other because we saw differences in, in electric logs, uh, particularly porosity logs between say Slumberjay or, or Halliburton or CompuLog. But regional screening, and this is where these, uh, the, the, where I see the benefit in, in these young da data scientists and, and, the, and the, the ability to, to run these algorithms and do things that we had to do by hand or, or takes uh, hours or even months or years to do that they can do uh, with, with some great computer science. And now all these different applications are out there and they're even teaching it in college. And, and uh, I think that's where the benefit's gonna come for the younger guys. They can do regional screening, uh, they can do attributes, but they need to understand. I think it's important. Uh, and this is a, a point I think that Steve made is if we all use the same data 
and the computer to make our maps, we're all going to get the same map. And we may not get any prospects at all. We're going to get the same results. So it's going to take something that turns the key and makes it a little bit different that generates the prospect. And that's where uh, the open mind comes in. But yeah, I'm all for uh, regional screen tools. Uh, you know, they, they use them now for landing zone determination and things like that. So there's there's an application out there. And I think that's what's going to drive the industry uh, forward, digital data transformation and access to information that we didn't have uh, 20 years ago. And, and I think that's where these younger guys are going to really, uh, really going to shine. Steve, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree with that 100 um, percent. I mean, especially when you're going from different vintage to different uh, service company logs. So, you know, I think the first thing you got to start out is try to, um, you know, normalize your gamma ray logs and then start tying them together from the, from that standpoint. And uh, again, yeah, I think the, the young uh, quote unquote data scientists and, and computer app folks that are maybe a little bit uh, at least quicker on the uptake than I am and some of that stuff, but the, the, there's a, there's a big opportunity to, to go through that, that type of process and, and uh, add a, add a new wrinkle to the, you know, the exploration and, and development of con conventionals. That's right. And we have a lot more questions. Uh, one um, question had to do with, with the um, rights of the, to produce. And so the question was, if a person is drilling an uh, unconventional well and they are producing it, do they necessarily have the rights to the shallower um, uphole section? Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, it, it varies depending on what basin, what what area you're in, but um, like that. Yeah, you, that's it. Especially with the, with the Permian, you know, probably not. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but. There's, there's a good chance that the that, that they've been severed. Same thing with the Eagleford is is one I know that there's a lot of um, uh, leases that are taken that are single target leases. They basically define uh, the zone of interest, and that's all the lease covers. So it varies. Uh, if you're going back into older basins with older uh, producers, eighty eight or older older uh, forms, then yeah, you probably have rights from the surface to the center of the earth. Uh, that's probably then come, it's probably then been restricted back under pew clause to your lowest producing zone plus 100 feet, but you get everything shallow. But those leases don't, I mean, the new leases don't, don't have it. It's very, very specific nowadays. So you have wells drilled through formations that the operator does not have interest in uh, at all. So yeah, there's opportunity uh, for that. Yeah, and I, we're out of time, but that brings, we have a number of questions that weren't answered that are in the chat. So I'll save the chat and I'll send it to both you and and um, Tom and, and you, Steve, and we'll, we'll, if we want to answer it and make it available, the answer is available. But um, that just brings together the, the idea that it's really important to have a good team member in terms of a, a, a land person. So for example, if they got the zone only, well, I mean, maybe they can shortcut by looking at the, the mineral takeoffs and the division orders of the um, of the um, shale pro producing zone. That may be the same. Well, this is this is the advantage of offshore. There's no zones. I mean, you propose your TD, and then you uh, present your uh, uh, will prognosis and everything, where, whatever or which depth you find some hydrocarbon, you own it. That's a good advantage of offshore. That's what I'm pushing a little bit toward looking at offshore. Well, I, yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> point too. Is that yeah, it's one of the benefits of, of offshore. It's, you're dealing with a whatever with you find, government. Yeah, whatever you find is yours. Yeah. So right. onshore, you know, I, I think if anything and you don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody because, you know, typically you'll find somebody that's very willing to tell you, no, we don't have rights or we do have rights or, you know, no, that well's plugged. And I know there's a question come up about orphan wells and is there a success rate behind them? And you have to watch, uh, you know, to see if those wells have been plugged. There's all that paperwork's available. It's just a matter of sorting through it and looking to see what people are doing and see where recompletion permits have been filed. So there's, there's a lot of things that, it becomes very much a, a data science 
undertaking uh, as much as looking like a, a, a you know, looking at samples, it's, you know, looking at old pieces of paper. But good news is it's most of it's digital now and you can dig through it on your computer. You don't have to have piles of uh, files in your office. Unless, Steve, you have piles of files, don't you? No, I'm, I'm trying to do a, get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. So we kind of over run our time commitment, but I just want to thank you, um, Steve and Tom, and want to thank the audience for a wonderful presentation, really enjoyed it. And just um, keep, stay tuned, you'll get an email from me with a link to the extended package and also to the recording. And thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thanks, for, thanks for tuning in, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. And join APG and, and you'll see in the April Explorer an article with an interview at, at, by uh, Steve Zodi about conventionals. So thank you.